um, this afternoon, we uh, want to give our attention to um, another area of Aquinas thought, uh, moral psychology and ethics. Now, what I'm going to say about his moral psychology uh, may help you to latch on to the papers on Aquinas that you perhaps heard at the conference last weekend. Uh, since the paper on um, Aquinas' view of the emotions, uh, Aquinas on the will, freedom, freedom and the good, those three papers during the day, really were all dealing with uh, his moral psychology. And um, what I'm going to do with that, uh, frankly, I have uh, organized uh, with um, what you could have heard last week in mind. And hopefully it'll pull the thing together in such a way that you may want to go back to the papers and reread them if you didn't get sex, that's still available. Now, um, uh, the place to start with Aquinas is essentially where we finished last time. Because like any theist, uh, Aquinas thinks of everything in terms of this relationship between God and creation. And if you're going to talk of human nature and ethics, uh, you have to do so in terms of the relationship between God and his creatures. Now, as we saw last time, the proofs for the existence of God, which um, Aquinas offers, show him to be not an Aristotelian God, just a final cause, but show him to be genuinely a theistic being, namely the efficient cause. In fact, as the first of Aquinas' proofs makes the point, the second rather makes the point, he is the cause of the whole cause of order. The premise is about an order of causes, of efficient causes. And there must be a cause for this order of efficient causes. In that sense, God is the cause of all causes, is all powerful. He empowers those secondary causes. And those secondary causes of which God is the cause, those secondary causes operating as part of the causal order in the creation, include human agency and human nature. Because what we are in our natures is part of the causal order. So human agency, then, is a secondary cause of which God is continually the cause. The cause of the whole cause of order. So then, when we um, focus our attention on human action, human behavior, the efficient cause of human action is the will. The will is the efficient cause. But we have to be careful how we understand Aquinas' concept of will. And that's all what all the eager and sometimes heated argument last Friday was about. Namely, that you have, um, in the history of Western thought, at least two concepts of will. There is one concept of will that um, emerges in the 17th century, perhaps a little earlier with William of Ockham. Uh, that would be in the 15th century. Uh, but the concept of will that emerged at least clearly in the 17th century, and I would suggest is your concept of freedom. Uh, because we've all ingested it in the very intellectual atmosphere of our times. It's the concept of a free will operating in a causal vacuum. That is to say, a free will which is not directed, influenced, determined by any causes at all. Now notice I said um, a range of things. Directed, influenced, now that wouldn't be sufficient cause to determine. Uh, let alone being determined, it's not directed or influenced by causal forces, if it's free. And so part of the dispute last week was between modern libertarian views, completely indeterminist, that is to say free will is independent of all causes, completely libertarian views, completely indeterminist, and a concept of will which does not talk of free will in those terms. And this other concept of will is not the um, indeterminist one. Uh, this concept of will, um, which um, Aquinas develops, you see, is a concept of will as intellectual inclination. The emphasis is not on choosing in a context where there are no causes affecting the choice, but of choosing where there are causes affecting the choice. But there is still choice. Now, how does that work? Uh, well, um, uh, what basically is involved in the difference is this that the 17th century conception of will is part of a mechanistic worldview, where everything is understood in terms of a movement and change uh, due to forces at work, billiard ball-type universe. All that you have to consider is material and efficient causes. On the other hand, what you have in Aquinas is a teleological worldview. Obviously, since Aquinas' philosophy is a modification of Aristotle's, where what you have to consider in talking of will is not just um, whether there is any other efficient cause than the will itself, but you have to consider formal cause and final cause as well as material and efficient cause. So whether or not there are other efficient causes pushing you to choose, there are final causes luring you in a direction. There are formal causes, your own nature, inclining you naturally in a direction. It's a teleological universe. And therefore he has a teleological conception of human personality, of human nature. Uh, human beings, that is to say, are end-oriented, like all of nature. Uh, there is a matter of intention, of inclination, that is native to us. But it's an intention, an inclination, which still needs to be informed. Needs to be informed. And it is informed by two kinds of things, basically. One is by the natural inclination with which we're endowed by virtue of the human natures. And, you know, I say plural because of individual natures in Aquinas. Because of the human natures which God has given to us. Natural end orientation. A natural inclination towards the good in general. Whatever that good may be. Towards our good. However, we can see our good. A natural inclination. This is um, Aquinas's echo of the Augustinian line in the beginning of the Confessions. Thou hast made us for thyself, O God, and our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. You see, this is the built-in inclination of the human soul, of the human person. 
And uh, that same notion of God as the good towards which, knowing it or not knowing it, we all have an inner built-in inclination, orientation. So this is one of the things which informs the inclination, the orientation of the person. The other thing which informs our orientation is the intellect. Uh, that is to say, in um, what we see, what we hear, what we learn, what we know, uh, we perceive things which seem to us good or things which seem to us bad. And those good things attract us. Bad things tend to repulse us. So in that sense, our inclinations are informed by the intellect. And uh, as Aquinas examines our sensory inclinations, inclinations that, that, is, uh, that have to do uh, with the um, sensory soul, sensory appetites, like Aristotle, he distinguishes rational soul from animal soul, you see, with its sensations, and so forth. So the um, sensory soul, the animal soul, the passive intellect, uh, has its sensory inclinations of two sorts. There are inclinations, passions, that are concusable. Uh, that is to say, these are desires for inclinations towards what is pleasing, what is desirable. Okay? Uh, the concusable. Concupiscible. <laughs> I said concusable. Concupiscible. Yes, uh, concupiscible. Uh, this. Concupiscible. Okay, I think that's it. And the, um, the other um, sensory inclinations towards the irascible. The concupiscible, what we perceive as good. The irascible, what we perceive as bad. Bad in the sense of being threatening. Unpleasant. Dangerous. So th this is the, the natural psychology with which we function. Inclined towards, inclined away from. The concupiscible and the irascible. But in addition to the sensory inclination, there is an intellectual or rational inclination. That is to say, the inclination of the rational soul, rather than the sensible soul. And the inclination of the, um, uh, of the intellect, of the mind, is um, towards that which is perceived as good, known in that sense as good, thought to be good. Now, uh, will operates in relationship to intellectual inclination. Uh, with the uh, sensible inclinations, these are simply spontaneous emotional responses. Uh, so there is no matter of will or freedom involved, except in so far as by virtue of intellectual inclinations we transcend and move in a different direction than sensory inclinations. Yes, sir. Now, the, uh, the intellect then needs to be informed. And it can be informed in a variety of ways. Hypothetically, God might directly inform it. It might be informed by our knowledge of scripture. And yes, indeed, he does a lot with uh, theological ethics. It might be informed by reason, in terms of a natural law ethic. But in any case, the intellectual inclination is what provides the direction of orientation of the will, which is the efficient cause of human action. Okay. Now, there may be human behaviors that are not actions. Uh, behaviors which are automatic. Uh, behaviors which are unthinking. But where the will is involved, intellectual inclination. Now, um, in, in that sense, um, one of the writers, um, the one who did the first paper on Friday morning, Westberg, suggested that the term will in Aquinas may be uh, akin, the equivalent perhaps, of the biblical use of the term heart. Out of the heart of the issues of life. The heart is the guiding core of the whole personality, as the moving force, the motivating force. Now, if the will is intellectual inclination, you say it's out of the heart and its orientation, its inclination, the will is not in a vacuum, in a causal vacuum. It has a natural direction, a natural set, which is influenced and guided and shaped in its particulars by um, what we know, what we perceive, by experience. Okay, so you get this picture, then, of um, Thomas's uh, will and intellect interrelationship. Now, um, Dud? Now, what do you mean by spirit? Uh, the... Um, Two things, I think. Uh, one, what I just said, that God could inform the intellect directly. Second, the Holy Spirit um, is the agent of divine grace. And his view of nature and grace, therefore, comes into play. Um, and the view of the relationship between nature and grace is roughly akin to the view of the relationship between reason and revelation. Okay? That is to say that just as revelation presupposes reason and what we can know by nature, so the operation of grace presupposes um, nature and uh, the normal operation of human psychology. So that um, what revelation does, and remember our discussion of faith and reason, if what revelation does is to reiterate some things that reason tells us, and then to tell us things that we cannot know by reason alone, so the operation of grace, you see, operation of grace, sustains the normal operation of um, human psychology, and adds certain causal influences, the work of the Holy Spirit, you see, in that operation. Um, yeah? In my understanding of this, um, the will is, is the efficient cause. Correct. We can perceive different things, we can perceive something as good or bad using the intellect, but the will automatically chooses the good. Um, no. The will automatically chooses... No, inclines towards rather than chooses. Inclines towards what it perceives as good, which may not, in fact, always be good. But if, if the intellect perceives something as good, the will doesn't need to be good. Yes, right. yes. Well, my question then is that it seems like the will, in just being an efficient cause, has a static nature, but comparing it to the heart, does that nature, it seems like. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by a static nature? Well, just in the fact that it seems like it, it, it always inclines towards what it perceives as good. So the perception may change, the intellect part may change. Okay. It always inclines to what it perceives as good. So the will yes. inclines to what it perceives as good to relate to the heart, which wouldn't seem to match because it's reading the Bible about it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in other words, you're saying that um, Westberg's analogy between the will and the heart breaks down at that point. 
more towards the intellect can change. You can perceive certain things as good. Yeah. More okay. Well, what, what I hear you saying that is that if you want to sustain the analogy, you'd have to say uh, that the will may actually orient itself towards the evil. Yeah. Exactly. But the question is, how does it do it? And I think Thomas would say it does it by saying, "Evil, be thou my good." But isn't that a process of the intellect saying that? Um, it's a matter of um, perceiving what is evil as being good. Now, then, the question is, what are the causal factors involved? Yeah. You see, uh, where well, the will is one, but it's not the only one. You see, there may be other causal factors, environmental factors, involved in the confusion of understanding. Yeah. Now, there's more to it, however, than that. Because you, you have to um, distinguish between the ultimate good, towards which, by nature, God is inclined us, the ultimate good. And on the other hand, uh, immediate goods. An immediate good, which is, in a sense, a means towards the ultimate good. And in regards to that immediate good, which, to which you may be inclined, um, there may be other um, lesser ends that you choose, you see. And um, uh, there are places where Aquinas seems to be saying that um, we choose the means, the will chooses the means. You see, whereas the intellect determines the end. Um, but inasmuch as the end down here is involved, that makes it sound as if will and intellect are both somewhat involved in these lesser goods, immediate goods, which are also means. Example, um, you may say that towards the ultimate good, um, you see um, the means that, uh, to which you're inclined, which you take to be the good for you, to be the life of a, you name it. Monk. monk. Okay. Uh, but in, uh, in saying that, that, the immediate good is the life of a monk, um, you know, there's more of a chance of being mistaken than there is up there. You see. And um, in moving towards the life of a monk, what are you going to do? And there are more choices to be made, all the way down. Now, um, in that sense, um, the means and the ends get tangled up together. Okay? And so the, um, um, the um, perversion of the personality of the heart, uh, Aquinas could well say, comes out in that interplay of will and intellect. Yeah. Jeff? How much strength does he put on the power of the will? Because it seems like, and you put, and I'm sort of interpreting this, it seems to be a little period, because he, yeah. he has an awful lot of strength in the will, even though it has causal influences, it's still, um, it's still free. It is still a cause. Yeah, it's a cause itself. An initiating cause, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, because it has so many causes, uh, sort of a cause Yeah, I'm not uh, happy with the claim that what you get is a contrast, a conflict between uh, libertarianism or indeterminism and the Aquinas. The conflict, as I see it, most clearly, is between a mechanistic and a theological worldview and making sense of freedom of will within those two different systems. Uh, so that um, freedom is not being in a vacuum and having to choose. Uh, freedom is having an inner directness towards an end that you gladly pursue. You see, freely, spontaneously pursue. So it seems to me that um, the differences between the worldviews, and I suspect that's why um, Hasker, in responding in the discussion, um, and Hasker was um, pinpointed because he's written in defense of libertarianism, um, he said, I think, well, I'm not sure that's what I mean by libertarianism. You see. And, um, right, because I think that some libertarians and determinists uh, would certainly say that that position does not require that one be in a causal vacuum, but only that there be some element of indeterminism in the whole situation, allowing the possibility of um, contrary choice. Yeah. Now, I saw somebody else here. Um, Tristan. Yes. Are those choices that reach the ultimate good then? Because the example that Professor Stone brought up about Bertini's son, I mean, he could have justified that choices for his immediate good. Yeah, I think that uh, Aquinas would have to say that the choices people make, they are making consciously or unconsciously out of their built in natural orientation towards the ultimate good. Now, the fact is that they may never have stopped to ask themselves what is the highest end? What is the ultimate good? Uh, but the natural orientation is such that one doesn't have to have thought what is the highest good to have an orientation towards it. You see? For Augustine, you don't have to have actually heard Augustine say, Thou hast made us for thyself, O God. To have what Schaefer used to call a God-shaped hole in your heart, or however he put it, God-shaped vacuum, something of that sort. You see. No, there may be a natural inclination that, we, uh, that we're not aware of. Um, now, insofar as we're not aware of it in those terms, insofar as, never, as we have never conceptualized what is the ultimate good, there is a much greater chance of that confusion of intellect resulting in our choosing lesser, as lesser goods, goods which are not really the best for the ultimate good. Yes, I would think so. I would think so, yes. Um, now, back over here, Jess. Yeah, um, you see, and I think the, the clue